Introduction, my name is Recep Ozdag. I run the Network Visibility Division. Um, the number one driver for visibility is really security. And the problem is that um, providing security is very challenging. Right? I mean, not a day goes by where we don't hear about a hack. You know, Home Depot, Target, Equifax, so many companies have been um, hacked, millions of records exposed, billions of dollars of market cap uh, loss. The problem is that our jobs are not getting easier. If you think about it, with being your own device, everybody is bringing their own device to their network, to their uh, offices, connecting to their networks. Most of these devices are not properly tested. And if you have any malicious content, it can now easily get into the enterprise network. So that's one challenge. Second challenge, encryption. Encryption is really great for us. Like, you know, we're texting on WhatsApp, everything is encrypted. So great for privacy. The problem, though, is that hackers are also able to use that encryption to hide, to hide their methods. So, if you think about it, we're doing, deploying all these tools, firewalls, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, but if they, if they cannot see the data, then they can't really do their, um, they, they can't really add value. So we need to be able to encrypt that data, send it to our tools to encryption, uh, to evaluation and assessment, and then decrypt them again. And of course, with TLS 1.3, our jobs are not getting any easier. Um, IoT, I, I mentioned, increases the attack surface. Um, every day, it's about 5 million new IoT devices connected to the networks. In fact, it's been shown that some cameras that are sitting on the shelves already have malware on it. So you, know, you, you buy it from the store, you go home, or you go to your office, you connect it, you're thinking everything's fine. I tested it. Well, it already has malware. Um, so th those are the challenges that we're dealing with. Last piece, of course, is cloud, because when you have your own data center, you can connect things, span ports, taps. You have access to the whole infrastructure. To, to provide visibility and monitoring. In the cloud, it's somebody else's infrastructure, and you don't really have access to all the packets, everything in the network. So that's only one challenge. The other challenge is there's this misconception that, well, i am just put everything in the public cloud. I don't have to worry about security. But that is not the case. Of course, security is a shared responsibility. So there are certain things that we as users or corporations have to do. So, because of this, there's a big need to be able to essentially look at packet data because packet data is the single source of truth. So if you look, look at a regular network, you know you have your branch offices, um, you have your core net network. Of course, we're now seeing SD WAN and cloud access and data centers. We want to connect all these tools, and this is really a very small sample. I mean, I had another slide with hundreds of companies. There was no, really no point. But if you look at the security, APM, NPM, and then cloud. The question is, how do you connect these tools to a network? It's actually very complicated if you think about it, because the average enterprise uses about 15 different tools. I visited a couple of banks. Um, there's, you know, th there's a group for um, uh, single sign-on. There's a group for inspecting various packets. There's a group that just looks at payloads. There's a group that looks at you know, uh, just uh, where you're connected to. They all want different pieces of the data. I'll give you more examples. Let's assume you have a 100 gig link and your tools only support 10 gigs. How do you connect it? Do you just throw away all the tools and say, I'm going to buy new 100 gig uh, tools? Or if some tools, you know, your intrusion detection system, only needs to look at the packet header, do you send everything? Well, you want to ideally trim it, not say, send the payload because it doesn't need it, and then get more efficiency out of that tool. Because they'll say, well, we can support up to 10 gigs um, throughput. Well, if you send everything, you're basically not using that tool effectively, so you'll be able to trim it. Um, if you're a bank or a hospital and you have sensitive data, maybe you want to mask some of that data because there's privacy rules. And again, it's really stemming from Europe, but now it's coming to the United States too, where you have to protect data. You can't really have, give access to everybody. So we really need a visibility architecture or fabric here so that we can access the data network and then send the right information to the right tools. Um, the first step is really to be able to access data. And for that, we recommend TAPS. Who, I mean, I'm sure that everybody knows what a span port is, right? So, so you can use a span port on a switch to just copy the data and you can send it wherever you want. The problem, of course, is that as the bandwidth utilization in your network goes up, span ports are the most first one to be dropped because it's, it's a luxury. It's not the really main production network. Um, so that's why we don't recommend it because just when you need that data, you start dropping it. A TAP, on the other hand, makes an identical copy. It's very simple. Just imagine fiber optics. You know, there's point A, point B, light goes in between. That's your communication. A tap is nothing more than a mirror. You just insert it there, and it copies some of that data out. So with a tap, you can 
copy the data outside of your network, but it doesn't allow any data to go inside your network. Of course, for physical connections, we can use physical taps, but for virtualized environments, we have to use something called a virtual tap, which Sushil will cover, cover later on. Now, we recommend tapping everything and everywhere, every, everywhere in your network to, to access all the data so you can eliminate blind spots. The problem is now you have terabytes of data, so there's just too much data. You don't want to send that to your tools because it's just financially not possible to monitor terabytes of data. So we need to be able to aggregate it and filter it down to where only, you know, maybe you only get it down to tens of gigs or hundreds of gigs. Number of things that we can do here, um, load balancing, packet capture, etc. This is where we start using a physical packet broker. A packet broker looks like a switch, smells like a switch, it's not a switch. It's a switch, you, you take it and you put it into your network, it has to follow certain protocols, it does neighborhood discovery, and then it forwards packets based on those uh, protocols. A packet broker, inside it might have an FPGA, it might have a network processor, server, it might have a switch silicon, and it allows you to do whatever you want, violating all the switching rules. That's why typically they're used out of band, although there's an inline case too, and I'm gonna talk about it. So um, let me just show a broader architecture of what is out of band monitoring. So this is your network, the black one. And here with the blue, we're tapping every, net, every port or every link using our taps. Because we're tapping, we're not we can, there's no way for us to inject any data here. Not possible, it's just one way. So we were basically copying all that data, but imagine if a, if a packet is moving from one switch to another, you might be tapping that same packet multiple times. So it doesn't really make sense to send it to all your tools that is on the right. You send it to a fabric of packet brokers and you can do aggregation, deduplication, right? So the packet broker will say, oh, you know what? The packet that was passing here is identical packet. So I'm gonna drop one of them and only send one, uh, the, the unique one to your tools. You can do load balancing. What, what if you know, you're deploying TLS 1.3 uh, SSL? It doesn't really make sense to ask all your vendors to support SSL. You can essentially do SSL decryption here in a centralized location, send it to your tools. You can generate NetFlow. If you don't wanna generate, send the data there, even though it's filtered, you can just send metadata in the form of NetFlow. So this is out of band because we're not, there's no way for us to inject data inside to this network. But if you're saying, well, uh, you know, I have intrusion prevention systems, and intrusion prevention system means I don't want to just know what's happening in my network, I want to prevent bad things from happening, obviously you have to bring it in line, right? So here you have a bypass switch. Assuming that traffic is going from inbound to outbound, this is just one example. A bypass switch will send it to your packet brokers and from there to all your intrusion detection or prevention tools. And then it will go through all your tools, come back and go to point B. So point A and point B will think that they're communicating to each other directly. In reality, they're going through this whole slew of tools that do the inspection. And if there's malicious content, you can just block it right there. Now, what if your packet broker fails? Ours wouldn't fail, but if somebody else's <laughs> fails. Um, but if any of your tools fail, what are you gonna do? Well, the bypass switch will can detect if any of these failed, and you can program the bypass switch to say, you know what, if the tool has failed, I don't want any data to enter my network because I, I cannot afford any malicious uh, uh, content to enter it if it's not been inspected. So p drop the packets if, if, it's, if it's not working. Or you can say, you know what, my service is much more important. I, I cannot afford any disruption. So just bypass that failed tool, but still do your job. So the bypass switch is meant to be something that can work with these tools, but it's very s simple. It has a um, failure rate is very low, high mean time between failure. So that bypass switch has to work all the time. And here I've used it in a redundant architecture. So if one of them do fail, the other one is still available. But it's really meant to be called fail open or fail close. So you can say, let the traffic go or stop the traffic from going. But this is inline. So um, while we've, you know, we talked about some of this, we talked about also a deduplication, data masking, SSL decryption, NetFlow. So many of these traditional, you know, switches cannot generate, cannot do deduplication. We typically use an FPGA. Um, you can't really do SSL decryption and encryption in a regular switch or a, or a generate NetFlow. 
So that's why these packet brokers are highly specialized devices. From the outside, it might look like a switch. It ain't a switch. And finally, you might say, you know what? Um, rather than just saying send port 5 data or this IP ad traffic to my tools, what if you could essentially look at the GUI, the tool told you all the, detected all the applications immediately and said, you know what, all this Netflix and YouTube traffic, I want to drop it. I don't want to send it to my tools. But this Oracle and Office 365, I want to just be able to grab it in my GUI, drag and drop, and send it for inspection. You can do that without entering any pattern matching commands, any regular expression commands. So this is very powerful, and we'll, I'll show a couple of screenshots. If you need to use a bunch of packet brokers, and you just want them to, rather than having to control them hop by hop using CLI, we have a single pane of glass management. So you can put a bunch of packet brokers together, and it's the same interface as if you're just controlling one. If you're wondering how the interface looks like, very simple. Imagine that out-of-band network example. These are ports that are connected to your taps, so coming from the network side. And these are ports that are going to your tools. Very simple. I can just do a drag and drop, and I can say, you know what? Uh, port 1 should go to port group 1, go into my tool, and do apply SSL decryption. Or how about I combine these two ports, do deduplication, take another port, and send all of them uh, to one of my tools, but also do load balancing. It's very intuitive. The user uh, in interface and user experience is great. And this is very important because some customers use it in a more of a set it and forget it manner. So they set up their monitoring infrastructure. So they say, OK, I'm monitoring this type of traffic. I'm doing deduplication. De 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 I'm doing SSL decryption. And they don't touch it for six months. Now, three months later, in the middle of the night at 4 AM, if you get an alert, there's an issue. And you have to go back and figure out what's happening, if there's an attack, something. The last thing that you want to do is, like, what was that obscure CLI command that was vendor specific that I used? Here, you can just come in and immediately see, oh my god, I know what I did. I'm doing deduplication here, I'm adding filtering, and I'm doing load balancing. Very easy. So it really helps with troubleshooting when you really need it. Um, here's another screenshot from our application intelligence. All the data that's going through the packet broker, we can tell you all the applications that are running without typing anything. Uh, all the countries, uh, top applications, top countries, what are the IP addresses. If somebody is connecting using a phone, an iPhone, we can tell you which particular iOS version that's running. We've added, of course, threat insights into this too, where you can essentially, there's a database. And as we look at all the packets in the net network, we can say, hey, you know, it seems like there's some malicious IP going on. And that database is updated every two weeks. So hopefully, this gives you a bit of an idea about what a network packet broker does, what a tap and bypass switch does, and what we mean by network visibility. Essentially, we look at all the packets in the network, tap, aggregate, trim, SSL decryption, NetFlow, and make it more affordable to, to uh, use your tools by eliminating blind spots.